Lily is back. Hey, Lily. You're such a pretty girl, is what it tells me. Are you happy? You're so happy to be home. You're so happy. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, you know, as you know, Lily's back from camp after getting kicked out, and she's very happy to be back. And many of you asked me about how my sister's uh, visit was this weekend. So rather than go through all the great things we did, uh, I think I'll just summarize the things that didn't happen. So we actually didn't have to go to the emergency room, although it was pretty close. Uh, the house did not explode, although the, it could have. And we uh, survived a 12-hour power outage, which made it all such a great weekend. Uh, but it's a classic weekend with my sister. But all is well. Okay, so let's move first. In, let's move to medical news because this is this is great. Uh, as you know, Florida survived the seaweed bloom. Uh, now we talked about the increase in death rate in COVID after the vaccines, but now leprosy appears to be going on in Florida. So we, we talked politics last week. So let's turn to religion. So uh, Luke 17 describes the moment when 10 men who had leprosy came and met Jesus asking for healing. And Matthew quotes Jesus who said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out the demons, because leprosy was thought really to be a curse uh, from God because of sin. <laughs> so why Florida? <laughs> Let each of you answer that question in your own way. Uh, so anyway, leprosy has been increasing in the South since 2000. And it's been almost a doubling of cases in the Southeast uh, United States, particularly in Central Florida. And in most of the cases in the past have been travelers who got leprosy in another country and came, but almost uh, a third of the cases now are newly acquired in, uh, in the United States. And so it appears to be that it's actually becoming endemic in certain parts of the Southeast particularly Central Florida. So what is leprosy? Leprosy uh, is also known as Hansen's disease. It's a chronic infectious disease by a bacterium called Mycobacterium leprae. It's in the same sort of class as tuberculosis. Uh, and it's, it has a predilection for skin and nerves. And there are three kind of key signs that in leprosy. The first is you get a hypopigmentation or an erythematous patch on your skin. Uh, if you look at bond biopsy, the peripheral nerves are thickened and you have acid fast bacilli, which are mycobacterium, uh, in biopsy material, and particularly in the, nerve, the, the cells that surround nerves, the Schwann cells. And what happens is the nerves become uh, deadened, and because of that, you have loss of sensation, you can have blindness. Uh, the, the reason that uh, lepers lost their limbs is because they never could, they couldn't feel them. And so there'd be trauma over time. And the same thing with uh, eye damage. It's transmitted, once again, by respiratory droplets through the nose and mouth uh, during close uh, contact. Uh, and it can be treated and cured. So, I mean, Jesus cured it the first time, but you can cure it with antibiotics and if you, if you get it within about early on, you, you can have a complete uh, cure. And people become non-infectious after about a week of treatment. Uh, again, public health, would you want a, a person with leprosy in your neighborhood not wearing a mask? Just, you know, get back to masks. Anyway, uh, there is one animal reservoir, armadillos. So next time you see an armadillo, don't go kiss it. Anyway, uh, what about COVID? So, Things are, once again, we, we talked about the surge last week. It's still surging. Uh, if you look at the number of, of wastewater sites that are reporting either 100% or two, over 100% increase, it's now up to 53%. Last week it was 46%. A few weeks ago it was 38%. So there's a dramatic increase in the amount of virus that's around. Actually, one of our viewers um, pointed out that there's another wastewater site called Bio, biobot.io data. COVID-19, which I'm going to review because it actually looks pretty good. I don't know their methodology yet, so I have to look at that. But it's, it looks like a really interesting site that's uh, sort of reporting wastewater throughout the nation. But this is CDC data. 
So if you look at where, where the hot spots are, uh, it's kind of all over, but it's big, it's really increasing in New York, uh, some parts of the Carolinas, the Midwest I mentioned last week, Houston is a big increase, uh, Dallas, and some parts of Colorado. And if you look at the Houston numbers, we're, we're up in almost every site, and we're at 132% of what the numbers were in July 6, 2020, in sort of right in the middle of the pandemic. So we're already higher in terms of viral volume, uh, viral load. What are the viruses? They, good for us, they all are XBB uh, 1.5 related, so there, it's, there's not been a giant recombinant. And it, this is the best way to look at it. If you look at the relatedness tree, how close they are is the based on the vari amino acid variation. And you can see they're all very clustered. So these represent one amino acid substitution or two. It's not a, be a big recombinant event, which would be a problem. Uh, now, does that, is that being reflected in any way? Uh, clinically, yes. Hospitalizations are now on the rise. And if you look at it, it's particularly in the 70-year-old. So over 70, there's been a big increase in hospitalizations, over 10%. And it's not just in our country. So if you look internationally, Greece is seeing the same thing, England seeing the same thing. So all of these are increasing. So, you know, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, how bats are an important reservoir. There was a really interesting study in Nature Communications. We, we know that from sampling bats, many bats have different coronaviruses. But what they wanted to ask is, do individual bats have more than one coronavirus at any one time. So these authors look, and by the way, this is all from the Yunnan province, which is, we've talked about that again, that's where the horseshoe bats live, that's where most of the horseshoe bats, that's why all these uh, scientists are studying those areas because that's the reservoir. Uh, so they, these authors looked at 149 individual bats collected from the Yunnan, uh, uh, Yunnan province in China. And what they found was many of the bats were infected with many viruses simultaneously. Now that's really important because when an animal has multiple viruses in what they then they can recombine. You know, if you remember, we talked about Omicron having so many different variations. It likely was in a single individual in South Africa that had either one or two or three uh, variants at the same time. And so there was a lot of recombination events. Well, that's happening in bats even as we, as we uh, sit here. Uh, and interesting enough, uh, there were five viral species that they identified that are likely to be pathogenic to humans or livestock based on their sequence relationship to other known pathogens. So these are viruses that are closely related to already viruses that are already have, have caused the disease in animals and humans. And there's one that has a novel SARS-like coronavirus that is similar to like the first SARS and SARS-CoV-2. And you can imagine a recombinant being a particular problem. And the interesting thing is what they found in this study was that the virus uses the ACE2 receptor, which is present in human tissues. That's very, that, that virus right there is very likely to, to jump to humans. So this is important, it's why we have to do surveillance because knowing this, we can isolate that virus, we can begin to anticipate it can be a problem and develop vaccines against it. So this is the importance of surveillance. It's also the importance of vaccine development. And it's also why people need to start realizing that vaccines are gonna be really, really important for managing uh, the future pandemics. There was also a really interesting study, we're speaking of animals that harbor the virus. Uh, this is from Nature Communication looking at white-tailed deer. We've, we've talked a lot about this over the year year and a half or so, that white-tailed deer seem to be infected by uh, SARS. But these authors collected 8,830 samples from free-ranging white-tailed deer across 26 states. And basically what they found was that white-tailed white deer viruses originated from 109 independent spillover events from humans to deer. And they could do this by looking at the sequence. Now that spillover also led to deer-to-deer -deer transmission and in, a, in, a few, in three cases, it looked like there's a potential for deer to deer to jump back to humans. So we have our own reservoir here in the white-tailed deer population. So again, a population that needs uh, to be sur uh, constantly under surveillance. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, for our wellness program. Uh, we've had a very great wellness program. It's, worked <laughs> it's, 
it's really great. Uh, but you have a very good wellness pro net program that is a very competitive in the state of Texas for being one of the best. This year we were ranked uh, number three among all organizations and number two uh, in Texas for the larger employer uh, category. These are based on having holistic views of workplace uh, health, understanding the needs of employee population, and proactively supporting well-being. And I want to congratulate our HR team that is leading the effort. Also, Harris Health got a great recognition uh, and received the uh, heart and stroke care uh, excellence from the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association. Uh, the 2023 recognition uh, uh, reflects Harris Health's elite status. And again, uh, these are safety net hospitals, but the programs they have for uh, intervention for cardiovascular care and stroke, absolutely outstanding and uh, some of the best in the nation. <laughs> which we appreciate because it, part of our mission, of course, is taking care of all people in the city of Houston. Uh, and then our clinical call center. M most call centers get nothing but headaches, complaints. Our call center has been getting compliments. So I want to congratulate everybody in the call center. We had a patient that uh, actually wrote in and said that not only were, was it you know, great service, but that the call center provided them in useful information, knowledge about what their problems were, solve problems in real time. There's nothing more important to us than that first interface when patients call us. And thank you, Call Center, for doing such a great job. So I want, that's enough shout outs for this week. I'm still recovering from my sister's visit. So have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you next week.